Hello and welcome to another edition of Chemistry and Society live here on Focus on Liberia. I'm broadcasting live from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm your host, Saki Golofale. Today we'll be discussing a very interesting topic, very important to the livelihood of people in Monrovia. Under the topic, residents in Monrovia, residents in industrial zones of Monrovia, are they impacted by chemical waste from industries? So today we've invited three notable individuals who will be discussing this issue and we'll be talking to them and asking questions about how these industries are operating and how are knowledgeable are the public on the issue of uh, chemical waste. We have here with us uh, Mr. Siafa Morris. He's an environmental consultant in New Jersey, USA. Mr. Morris, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Golovari. Great. And we also have Mr. Jerry To. He's an organic chemist and he represents the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia. Mr. To, welcome. Thank you very much. Great. And the topic we're discussing today are, is not something that is normally discussed. And I think that uh, people listening will and watching this live will uh, feel the importance of discussing these issues and also taking some action to make sure that we are living a healthy life. So we're talking about residents in industrial zones of Monrovia. Monrovia uh, hosts a population of over one, one million people. And uh, we've seen that uh, the war, the impact of the war uh, led to mass urban migration. And people are occupying those uh, post-industrial and active industrial zones in Monrovia. We're trying to know how, how what's the impact of people living in these industrial zones how is it impacting our health? What's the operations from these companies? Are they going by environmental guidelines? Are they following the environmental protection agencies, laws in protecting human health and well-being? Uh, we'll get started with this. Uh, we expect that one of our other uh, guests who's uh, still yet to join us, uh, but we'll get started with this. And uh, first talking to uh, Mr. To, uh, representative from uh, the EPA. Uh, let's get to know uh, Mr. To. Yeah. Uh, you work with the EPA. Our viewers, our listeners out there will want to know what is the EPA of Liberia? What, what are you doing at the EPA? What's your work like? Well, EPA, as the name entails, EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia. Uh, it is uh, the government arm that is responsible to protect the environment in collaboration with line ministries. So as it entails for companies that are coming into Liberia, such as cement coal, beer factory, the environmental protection law, uh, the, the, the environmental protection and management law says that uh, whenever any project is about to start in Liberia, there should be a procedure that we call the environmental impact assessment. And you know that uh, EPA was created around 2003. At the time, Simeco, all these companies were already existing. Great. So what is done is that uh, these companies that like BF factory and uh, Simeco that were in existing before EPA was created, they did what we call environmental management plan. All right. So that okay. means that prior to, prior to EPA being established, or uh, was there any regulation from the government that these companies follow? Not to my knowledge. Great. So all these companies now, after EPA has been created, we subjected them to do an environmental management plan. And since then, we have been monitoring them. Great, great. We'll come back to talk about more about that. EPA okay. and our, our Mr. Morris, our, you are an environmental consultant. And this topic we're discussing our residents in industrial zone of Monrovia. Are they exposed to chemical waste? But first tell our viewers out there, uh, what is Mr. Morris doing as an environmental consultant? <clears throat> well, basically, this year for Morris, what we do is, um, I'm more into environmental remediation. So we identify contaminated sites around and then 
I work with a licensed cyber remediation can, professional. Can, can, I mean, can you break that down a little bit in remediation? <laughs> our our viewers would like to know what, okay. what remediation is. Okay. So basically, remediation is like cleaning up the environment. That's what we do. Right. We identify the problem in the environment, and then we get involved with so many different activities. And at the final end, is about cleaning the environment up to eliminate of the, the pollutant or the chemical that was disposed of there. And many at times, this situation arises from about legacy contaminants. It's residual, waste or residual contaminant. Long ago, the factory has closed down, but the effect of the pollutant or the, 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 the technically what happens is these chemicals linger in the environment. And it only take one person to come down with some illness and then it becomes a problem for the society or for, for the environment or for the government. And when they notice these things, then they call on us, the consultants, to identify it, discuss it well. I mean, go down to the, to the wire to the extent that you have to identify the best method possible to clean up the environment. So that's what we are into. Great, great. We'll get to know more and some of the things you're talking about later. Uh, we've just been joined by uh, Mr. Len Goma. And I first want to apologize to Mr. Goma. Your name was misspelled on our flyer. It is an apology to you. And uh, we'll get that correct in the future. But you're just joining us where uh, your colleagues here are talking about what they do at their various uh, work site. And uh, you work at the EPA as an environmental chemist. Uh, tell us uh, what your work is like. Are you there? I think he's on mute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Saiki. Apology accepted. Yeah. It's just I'm facing some kind of an internet problem. My connection yeah. is kind of very, very cracky. I don't know if you can you hear just... me out there. We're hearing yeah. you clear. We hear you. We hear you. Okay, sorry, I'll just join and and I don't know pick up from, but uh, I think I heard you talking about uh, what are the residents are of the industrial zone are exposed to chemical, right? Well, first we're asking you yeah. what 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 work do you do at EPA? You are an environmental chemist. What, what, what do you do? Our, our viewers would like to know who you are. Okay, so... <laughs> My name is Len Goma. Um, I'm an environmental chemist at the EPA. I work in the Department of Compliance and Enforcement as one of the technicians. And I also hear the Chemical Registry of Liberia and also a proxy focal point to the Stockholm Convention for Persistent Organic Pollutant. Great, great. So just picking up from there, you talk about the Stockholm Convention and and especially with persistent organic pollutants. Let's talk about uh, the the state of industrial activities in in Monrovia. We, we focus on Monrovia because it's, it's densely populated and there are a lot of industries around, especially in the freeway area, the free zone. Well, uh, let, let's talk about uh, the Stockholm Convention. What is it about, Mr. Gorman? And I will come to Mr. Toll to add to that. Uh... I think relatively the the uh, the state of the the industrial area, right? So basically, uh, we have normal activities ongoing as usual. People are engaged into their normal activities, and the EPA the issue of let's say our uh, exposure. Is, is normal as you know. Basically, let me get a little premise by saying, uh, first of all, we are all made of chemicals. That's what you know for sure. Uh, the water in our and bodies, the, the, the carbon dioxide, the oxygen that you know, are involved in the respiration and other chemicals you know, that are essential for our metabolism. So uh, uh, that's not an issue, but the major issue there is that uh, the artificial chemicals because you know for our quest man as a whole our quest for good life and um, our quest for wealth and so forth we manufacture chemicals right um, yeah. 
because we manufacture these chemicals, we are exposed to them, to several kinds of chemicals every day. That's what you know for sure. In our homes, in our cars, in the, uh, uh, even our ornaments and so forth. All over around the world, we see phytalic, uh, we see pesticides in our food. So just, just as you know, we are exposed to chemicals, even in the great United States of America. If we are exposed to chemicals, uh, uh, in our normal day lives, it means that even in our industrial zone, or most of our industrial zone, obviously, yes, we are exposed to chemicals in industrial zone. So, uh, because of this, what really happens is, is, is why you have uh, regulatory bodies all over around the world. You know, they are there to to set up standards and 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 uh, uh, regulations to ensure. The safety of the public. So obviously, okay. yes, we have uh, chemical emanating from the identical industrial zone. But what is most yeah. important is that the amount at which they are, you know, they are exposed to. That's one we can control because you know that exposure uh, uh, also has to do with the the amount. So the intensity yeah. is very very vital in exposure, and because the intensity can be controlled, that's why we set up regulations and so, uh, yeah so that we can make sure that the public is is, is safe we'll, we'll talk about that how 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 does epa uh measure intensity of exposure we'll talk about that later on and uh mr to the issue yes. of the stockholm convention how how relevant it is to liberia your role as a focal point at epa well stockholm convention is uh it's an international treaty that is uh intended to protect Hemo health, hemo from uh, from persistent organic pollutants. Uh, this convention came into force in 2004, and uh, Liberia became party to this to the convention around 2006. And, and what happened is that we, as 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 the country decide to join the party to 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 sign to the party. We do something like uh, uh, an assessment, okay, a national plan, a national implementation plan, and Liberia completed its first national implementation plan in 2006. Great. And so, this the the intent of this of this of this uh, convention is to protect the human and the environment from harmful substances. This persisting or getting pollutants, okay? Yeah, so I, I, wanna, I wanna hold you there and just connect to the issue of uh, protecting uh, people from harmful sub substances. Uh, uh, it was in a local delay quite uh, uh, almost two years ago that the Library Electricity Corporation was fined some 10,000 US dollars. And talking about persistent organic pollutants, you know about PCBs, the poly polychlorinated biphenyls. Yeah. They are part of the persistent organic pollutants. And yeah. as part of one of EPA's, on EPA's report, the uh, EPA Liberia report talks about there are, are LEC uh, attempted uh, disposing some are uh, uh, faulty transformer. And, and, and they, they tested those transformers, they found their traces of PCBs. And, and apart from finding LPR, I mean, uh, uh, LEC, what else? Did the EPA do to protect uh, people from being exposed to those uh, PCBs? What we we do that through uh, through awareness, awareness, and besides besides awareness, we try to identify uh, area that high concentration of the P, uh, PCB. Okay, uh, and. Uh, what happened around the uh, the old bone mine area? Yeah. After bone mine left, there was suspicion that there was some old transformer, and so there was assessment done. Right. Okay. We identify these sites, and we make sure that these 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 uh, site people do not uh, get closer around there, you know, to be contaminated. Okay. So, right. Great. Right. So. The issue here is that we were we're discussing how much people are exposed to our our industrial 
uh, pollutants or chemicals, whether it's post-industrial zone or active industrial zone. Mr. Morris, you've heard our two uh, colleagues here talking about the Stockholm Convention. And with respect to Liberia uh, being a member or, or signatory to the Stockholm Convention, what is what is your take here? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Golafari. I mean, I listen to uh, Mr. To uh, reference uh, the issue of uh, the transformer in a bombine breach area. I mean, no. Not bomb my bomb my company. Oh, bomb my oh, bomb my company. Bomb my, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Now the thing about that is contaminants do linger. Oh, Even if you remove the source, because there is one unique thing. As long as there is a soil, when a contaminant is introduced to the soil environment, it adheres. To the soil grain under the right condition of pH, temperature, and activity, those compounds that are attached to the soil grain tend to leach further into the ground as far as probably to the aquifer. And here is a unique thing. I'll take you to uh, I read uh, on the EPA website about um the, re the chemical regulation guideline and in that guideline, mentioned that um, residents shouldn't live uh, within 100, 100 meters of an industrial uh, complex or industrial building. Yeah. That sounds so beautiful. It sounds so pretty. But again, like what I just mentioned, the aquifer. The aquifer is the underground bedrock, which contains water sources. And when it takes a contaminant three miles away to reach me three miles downwind or down river or down the, the aquifer, because we all collect, because take, it, take, take for instance Liberia, our major source of water is well or borehole. Yes. That's our major source. And so a hundred meter is like 300 feet or 320 feet. And someone even three miles down the road could be affected by a contamination that happened three miles up the hill. Yeah. So okay. let me let me let me let me take you from right there, talking okay. about the proximity of okay. residents to our, our pollution or industrial sites. Right. Let, let's let's look at the issue of the battery factory. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Cole will want to tell us if he has if he knows the history of, of the battery factory, what used to be there. But what I want to bring to your attention is uh, there is a national clean industry right in the battery factory. And that battery factory uh, right across the road from where the old battery manufacturing site used to be, there is a huge clay mining, that what we call potter. Potter is being mined in that area and the potter is being sold on the market. So yeah, I just wanted you to uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, about residents in that area and of course uh uh, uh the battery factory is an is a uh, old industrial site so what's your take on people in that area well uh the battery factory the smell code area this area were classified as what as industrial area and as residents we come to encroach around this industrial area there was some impact on a resident. I don't know much about the battery factory because at that time I was not in Moria, but there was an incident on the pit factory about their wastewater coming out of the uh, uh, factory, flowing through the community into a wetland. Hey. We intervened. We went and intervened and we make sure that uh, uh, the wastewater is controlled. Okay. Right. We also went into the factory to ensure that that the 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 the, the paint that is being produced there is lead free. And right. we were given that assurance. So we 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 are we are we are working with this with this with this uh uh, uh paint factory and also that paint factory also did what we call environmental management plan. And they made what a quarterly report to EPA. 
But the issue of, of the impact of their activity to the environment, I mean, to the, uh, uh, the resident, is, is it came to our knowledge and we, we did intervene. So oh, great. So talking about the same budget factor area, uh, uh, CFR, uh, you, uh, you've, you've altered uh, articles on heavy metals and, and are uh, assuming that the battery factory used to have lead acid batteries, you know, and, and it's, an it's an abandoned industrial zone. People are inhabiting that area. Right. And more interestingly, across the road from the old battery factory is the mine clay there, what we call potter. And right. it's, it's sold on the library market. Right. From the heavy metal, heavy metal toxicity and the whole chemistry, right. what's your take on that? I mean, that area should be closed off. It should be closed off. An environmental impact assessment that was done earlier on, I mean, before battery factory opened, now that the factory has closed down, people mining potter in our area is just wrong because we don't know how much chemical were released into the environment. So until an analysis is done, soil sediment uh, collector, soil sample collector, water sample collector, and analyzed in several different locations within our battery factory area, that area should be closed off and sealed off until they can, they can verify what is in the soil. Mind you, lead is a heavy metal. Yeah. Lead has an impact on individuals, whether a kid, an adult, lead has an impact on every, every, every individual. So for babies, cognitive problem. For adults, similar thing. So if you, if you don't know what exists there, but the fact that there was an old factory there producing lead acid battery, until we can we can come out with some verification that the soil is indeed free, that place should be sealed off. It should be closed off. But again, that's Liberia. Yeah, and that's the impact of urban migration. I mean, it, it, yes, urban migration has its own take, has its own upside, has its own downside. And the fact that people don't know, we as environmentalists are close with the authority, at least. To help guide them, to guide their understanding, to guide their thinking into what they're playing with. If they don't know what's going on, now we have to tell them. The authority has to tell them. The government has to tell them. Especially the EPA, somebody has to come out and say this because you can't. Here is an interesting thing. You you can't allow people into the area unless you verify that it's free of uh, lead and any other heavy metal that produced as byproducts from uh, from uh, the factory. You can't allow people into there, but like you said, people are mining potter. I went across that area a couple of times, some years back, and it's a huge market ground, a huge market ground. And I take you back, 1923, when gasoline was manufactured for the internal combustion engine, lead was an additive to improve the quality of the engine and how lead was an additive into the gasoline so that it can improve the quality of the gasoline engine. And that went on for years, years. Lead was being dispersed off in the environment, in the atmosphere. And when people got to know, when the authorities got to know, many people had come down sick. Many children had neurological uh, functions problem. Many babies had cognitive uh, uh, malfunctions. Many yeah. adults had similar problems. What, when did they analyze? What did they come out and find? What did they find out? They found out that lead was the problem, and that's how lead was removed from gasoline. We 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 migrated to ethanol or other useful product. So it's the same thing. Right now, if you just collect a soil sample anywhere in Liberia and analyze it, most especially in a in a very virgin environment, you'll find some contents of lead there. Now it all depends on the concentration because lead doesn't bio. I mean, it bioaccumulate. It doesn't disintegrate. It's yeah. not biodegradable. So it builds up in the tissue. The effect may not be noticeable in the short run, but in a very long let me, run. Let me hold you right there with the non-biodegradable. Our viewers are, you know, these big chemical terms, you know, non-biodegradable. Okay. Can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, we'll it's, like, it's like, yeah. Degrade. Are oh, you talking to Mr. Toe? Sorry. No, no, no. I'll go to Mr. Toe after you. Speak. Oh. You can go ahead. Okay. Biodegradable for our body to be able to destroy it. Let's just come from there. 
let's take it that simple way. If it enters our body, how our body will be able to destroy it? How our body will be able to degrade it? How about we be able to reduce it to get rid of it? Once it enters up, it doesn't get out. It's non-biodegradable. So instead, it, bow, it, it accumulates, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. And when it reaches a certain concentration in a human body, then the effect becomes noticeable. That's the issue Great. of it. Great. So uh, I think we need more uh, time to talk about this whole biodegradable thing and, and so people can understand more. But Mr. To, let's let's come to let's let's deal with industry by industry in the free zone area. Let's come to Simeco. You work at the EPA and and Simeco has been in Liberia for or uh, more than for since 1968. And yeah. and before we go into the conversation with Simeco, uh, let me say that this uh, conversation is in no way uh, an attempt to denigrate Simeco or promote any business institution. We're discussing issues of public concern. That's all that matters. Uh, our Simeco has been operating, and and I've uh, I live in 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 like in Monrovia. I pass on the freeway. We used to see you know like smoke or something coming out from Simeco, and all our like cloudiness around the community. What what what's about Simeco operation that when what impact it has on the the, the communities around there? Well. I'm a living waste when you're talking about impacts. Yeah. The first impact I want to address is the noise impact. Mm. Because I live around the Sibeco area there for about five years around the Doe community. The noise impact, including the, 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 the impact from uh, on the flower, the noise impact. And I, I brought this once, uh, I think that was in uh, 2014, I brought it to our ESIA meeting, you know, for us to discuss it. But what I was told is that that whole area is what? It's an industrial zone. Yeah. People encroach there. So the, 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 the noise pollution there is something that you can avoid. What about the chemical pollution? Are there any chemicals that we should be our uh, mindful of from Simeco? Well, Simeco, uh, if we, the, the, the pollution that is, that is associated with uh, Simeco is the dust. Mm -hmm. The dust. And another pollution that I, I feel that is inevitable because of the, the product use. They use calcium carbon to heat it up, so they put a lot of greenhouse gases, which is oh. yeah, fine. It's, it's, it's some of the byproducts that come from, uh, from there. This is something that we don't see. But what is visible is the dust. The dust. And we, 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 went, we went there once to do that assessment because there was a flower factory not far from where the, 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 the cement factory. And so we thought that there was going to be a well, cross uh, uh, pollution or uh, product. And so when we did an assessment there, okay. when it comes to the products, the cement dust are controlled because that's a product that they are controlled by the company. But there, again, when the cement is back, put it in the truck, there are dust all around. Yes. Yeah, so then, you, you, at you, the same time, when they are taking when they are taking their 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 their, 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 their product from the port, from the port to the factory. There's so dust all around there. So these are, but when it comes to chemicals, uh, we try to control the wastewater from the factory from the time they, 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 they did an uh, environmental management plan. The affluent from the factory is being controlled. Good. So you, you made a very interesting point about the uh, flower factory you know, about cross like pollution or something. And uh, that our viewers want to know, how is it that our food, the non-food industry is that close? What, what's the whole rationale? Is, is, is there a right or wrong about that? A oh, flour, that's the premium milling, pre premium flour milling is close to Cemento. Yeah, before, before the permit was given, 
an environmental impact assessment was done. And after that impact assessment, I personally, with other Google, when I did a, a whole day assessment, one of our concerns was that the flower particle were going to contribute to the particulate matter in the air. But that was completely negative when we enter. And when it comes to cross-contamination, it was also out because Smeco and the flower factory, they are not on the same line. So it's not possible for particle to flow from Smeco to the flower bed or flower to flow from Smeco. We did that study. It's, it's not possible. Great, great. Uh, uh, Mr. Morris, yes. your take. I mean, Mr. Toe mentioned calcium carbonate as being a raw material for the cement, uh, cement core, the cement factory. Now, you must understand something. Calcium carbonate was mined for a, from a geological environment. Now, I, I don't want to be too technical, but that was you can, break it, you can break it down. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. The castle company was forming a heavily reduced environment. And <clears throat> other substances were present. Sulfur, nitrogen. They present in the castle company. What they are brought to the plant or to the to, to cement coal and get heated up. The complex chemistry occurs in a way, particular matter such as sulfur, a gaseous matter such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide are also produced. Mm -hmm. And they are emitted through the smokestack into the atmosphere. When these things are aspirated, of course, they're going to obviously have an impact on the human body. Beyond that, if it does rain and the rain comes in contact with the sulfur dioxide or the nitrogen dioxide, I mean, the nitrous oxide, there's a possibility that nitric acid could form or what you call acid rain. Yes. And obviously, acid rain forms, it has an impact on plant life, even on younger generation, younger people. So the issue of cement coal, listen again, like he said, environmental impact assessment was carried out. They are the expert. Not, not with Smeco, not with Smeco. No, I mean, I'm trying to, 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 to align it with um, the flower yeah. factory. So, this go, someone said there is no connection, they're not on the same line. Well, again, a, a critical study has to be carried out. Exactly. It's not something somebody just said by word of mouth saying, no, this ain't happening, that ain't happening. We need to carry on an actual analysis of the air content within our area. We need to do that before we can run a, a conclusion and say, no, this can't happen. This is going to happen. That but is our, our, our conclusion should be based on solid research. It should be based on solid data, solid evidence. Evidence <laughs> arrived from absolute scientific work. That's it. Do the science and give the people the data. They, they let them make the decision on the basis of the data that was arrived from a, a true scientific study. Not based on eyeball or male observation. Yes, eyeball. The eyeball can sometimes do work before the scientific <laughs> study coming. <laughs> listen, <laughs> do you know why they got sea breeze? No, I listen. I agree land, with you. We got land breeze. We got sea breeze. I agree. Uh, I agree. And it's a breeze that will that will that will blow the particle from Smeco to the flower mill. Yes. Uh -huh. But if you if you sit over there. The sea, the wind does not blow in that direction. The wind blows from the ocean right. straight towards the Grand Bay area. That's that's the aspect. But with respect to those uh, particles you're talking about, the emission you're talking about for Smeco, these are things that are inevitable. You can't avoid them. They're associated with what? With, 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 with industry, the no. emission. You don't see it. You don't see it. I, I, I mean, I agree with you. There is a zero impact. As as the, the SO2 go up in the air, it forms a dilute sulfuric acid and, and, and become an acid rain, and it affects the environment. Absolutely. I mean, that's it. Great. But, yeah. I mean, these, are, these are impact that are not, you, you cannot avoid them. So what people 
and left and right, I should do that. If you have your car outside, mm -hmm. you should have something like a plastic over it. No, that's all. Yeah, so I, well, I, I, yeah, I, yes, I agree with you again. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so let, let, let me just come I mean, here. The, the, so, the limitation of our science years ago, or the inadequacy of our science years ago, restricted our thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. Look at it today. The inadequacy of our science today have restricted our thinking about the future. Meanwhile, we will get there. Sure. A couple of days sure. ago, there was a new robot that was sent onto where Mars, right? It landed. Our science is getting complex. The complexity of our science helps us to help help us to improve our lives better. Now, with respect to the smoke star coming from our from our Simenko, I mean. Is it not possible to retrograde or retrofit some equipment there that will try to reduce the amount of sulfur dioxide or natural oxide that come into the atmosphere? Sure, sure. It can be. No, it can let, be. Let's, 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 it. let's close up on Simeco and we'll go to the next one. A very important part of it okay. here. I know. Uh, I know. Len yes, has well, been having so, trouble so, trouble so, with so, his with his with his internet, but I will come to him. The both of you are uh, 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 Mr. To and and Mr. Goma. So, the, I, 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 I read yes, in so, so let me just check in with the Simeco issue. I, I will come to you. I, I'm, I'm coming to Please. you. We're still on the Simeco issue. Just hold on a little bit. Uh, I read in one of the local dailies, uh, the New Dan newspaper, they said that uh, okay. there was an issue okay, with, okay. there was a serious concern okay. resi residents in the Bilima area. They, they, they raised a concern when Simeco was demolishing their over 40 year old factory that the concerns that people they have been exposed to asbestos and uh of course uh according to the new dan newspaper in 2018 the government conducted medical examinations of dozens of residents in Bilima community and uh the doctors established that cement dust from the company was causing disability and lung infection but the issue of the asbestos are uh, uh, exposure let's address it quickly mr to and then uh, Len, you can come in later. Okay. You muted? Tell me again, you said? Yeah, there was a story about uh, Simeco was demolishing their, their, their old factory and uh, people were concerned that they were being exposed to asbestos. You know, asbestos is, is normally in old buildings. You know, from from uh, before the ban came into place, I'm not sure uh, about the regulation in Liberia. But you want to speak to that well, a little bit? I I I, I can remember vividly. That could be about three years ago. Yeah. And and that that the removal of it was it was not hundred percent asbestos. The roofing sheet were yes, it was asbestos, but some were not asbestos. And those roofing sheets were removed by a certified uh, 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 waste seller provider. This guy took a training from the states, and he took the asbestos, carried the asbestos somewhere to Johnsonville, where he safely disposed of them. But besides that, some of us zinc, some of the asbestos zinc, for true, the 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 resident complained. And what we did is we found pieces of the asbestos in the surrounding area like Berima and also in those community. Wow. Yeah. But but the removal of 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 the asbestos of Smeko was was done by the independent evaluator who did it safely. But then some of the the, the resident over there took some of the roofing uh, roof, uh took some of the, the, the zinc. Carrying the community with the intention to while they use a roof a roofing sheet, and we found it out. That that, that yeah. was true. Yeah. Thanks for that clarity. Thanks for that. And Len, you wanted to come into the issue of Simeco, and then we can go to another topic. Just quickly. Len. All right. Are so you there? thank you very much. You know, I've been having yes. Yeah, I'm here. So I've been having the difficulty with my network, but at least it's, it's kind of okay now. So um, you were talking about Simeco and then the, the, the flour mill, the premium flour mill. 
actually, I haven't seen a particular value, you know, from a distance between a non, uh, let's say, a non food processing plant and that of a food processing plant. But I know environmentally that uh, a food processing plant, the site should be you know, situated uh, in an environment free as far as possible, you know, from any hazard that might you know, jeopardize the safety of the food product produced. But in the case of Simeco and the flour mill, I think that this thing was very, very far, right? How be it? The EBA ensured that uh, the premium mill was relocated and with an improved design. Today, they are no longer to, you know, the side they used to be, they are no longer around that free port belt. And speaking of Simeco, um, I think they have improved over the years through the guardians of the EPA to ensure public safety. Now, at the port there, they have what we call, uh, they have employed what we call an echo hover. You know, what the echo hover does is that it serves as a suction because mm -hmm. when the raw material comes into the country, they need it to be offload. So the suction, the echo hover that serves as a suction that you know, attracts all other uh, particular matters that are emitted into the air in that it also helps to limit uh, the impact on the environment. Additionally, uh, they have also built new silos, right? And continue rise or enclose their entire operation, right? That can also avoid massive emission to the environment. Recently, if you look at Simeco area, they have also started to build green belts. Now, those green belts, eh, they imported trees from, from Ghana and so, they started to build those green belt around the periphery, which is good, you know, for reducing carbon emission, and also reducing carbon footprint. So one of the major issues we've been having in Liberia is the issue of, you know, uh, industry operating before the establishment of the EPA. You know that most of the industry were already operating at that place before even the establishment of the National Environmental Commission, which transitioned into the EPA. So there are a lot of work we have to do. At that time, uh, you talk about battery factory. Battery factory, for I'm sure, I know that uh, their operation discontinued far, far years before the establishment of the EPA. At that time, there were no regulatory bodies. So there's nothing like even a decommissioning plan to be presented. So we have a series of issues that we really need to tackle in this country as a regulatory body. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to chip in with, with, with great, that from great, Simenko. Great, great, that's great input from land. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, viewers, you are, are watching uh, Focus on Liberia. This is an edition of the Chemistry and Society that comes on every two weeks. We're here today discussing our residents in industrial zone of Monrovia. Are they exposed to chemical waste? What's the impact? And we have uh, three notable people here who are discussing these issues. And it's very important and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. But let's go to our uh, viewers' comments and let's uh, let's let's see what our viewers are saying out there. Uh, we'll be uh, looking and reading the comments, and uh, you may want to uh, uh, answer, uh, respond to some of the questions or, or concerns. Our listeners' comments. So, our uh, one from uh, Musu Wangalo Stewart. People should not live in close proximity to industrial zones uh i i think uh that is more about uh the zona law issue it, it, uh, any one of you have input on that and uh the next people encroach on land around those industrial areas please explain whose fault it is how has it been addressed are you saying people are living in at their own rates so uh, one of one of the uh, uh, commenter said that uh, people people are going to industrial zones, and there are other people saying, uh, focus on Liberia, saying people encroach on the land, and are they doing it at their own risks? Uh, what's yeah. your take? I mean, if I if I should chime in, look, I'm reading that people encroach on the land around those industrial areas. If you encroach, it is unlawful. It is unlawful if people encroach. Yeah. I might be hurt. It is unlawful yeah, yeah. if people yeah, encroach on, on, on an industrial property or on an industrial land. Now, it is the government uh, responsibility to stop these people. 
stop them. Even, even if they are building the most fancy structure there, if it has to be demolished, nobody is bigger than the government. No one individual is greater than the government. Because let these contaminants there, you don't see them with the naked eyes. They do exist. They do exist. And so if yeah. people encroach on these industrial properties, what the government should do is, that's why you have inspectors. That's why you got people, people going around all of the time inspecting these areas you notice something unusual you stop it in its track you nip it in its butt even if they have built a fancy mansion you destroy it if there's a law for that people should respect the law good so another comment from mercy mercy boyman zinbo with all the dust in the air the government then allow a flower of industry opposite cemento well uh, we've already heard from our experts, those who work at EPA, they are saying that that is not uh, a possibility. They are not too close. And uh, John K. Jala here is saying it was a, pro it was a proposed cement factory called Fatu Corporation that was in close proximity to Simeco. Okay. All right. So more on our comments, uh, Minister Eric Opon. Uh, it's saying here, every industry has effect on global warming. Yes, because of the industrial benefits when it comes to jobs, the growth of the economic economy when it comes to process processing things, that that is why America withdrew from the climate agreement. Well, that's something to argue about. Uh, of course, the U.S. government is going back into the Paris Climate Agreement. No matter how you put it, industries has great impact on the ec economy. The pros, uh, economic yeah, pros, is sure. greater than risks. That last, that there is less harm. Let's stop the, the becoming over critical when we have a dying economy in Liberia. Now, here is the talk: the economy versus human health and well-being. What's your take? <laughs> Look, let me come in. We have, we have to balance it. That's exactly. Yeah. We can. We have to balance it. Yeah. All right, Mr. Ahead, Fulham, let me just give my talk quick. You, you come in there. We have to balance it. <laughs> okay. I was reading on the, the national implementation. It needs to be balanced. That's, that's the most difficult thing. It, that's a way we can balance it. Look, I was reading the um the national implementation plan that Liberia submitted to um the Stockholm Convention. And hmm. somewhere in there, I read that Liberia does not have a toxicity release inventory. We don't have that. And what does that mean? Can okay. you break it down a little bit? I will break it down for you. Every industry inputs some kind of chemical that's supposed to sustain the industry, the reason why they were there, the reason why they are somewhere, the reason why they did a function. So take for instance, Simeco input a certain kind of chemical how much of that chemical gets used for the product? That's one aspect of the story. How much of that chemical gets released into the environment is another aspect of the story. How much of that chemical is stored away is a, it's a third part of the story. Now, if we have an inventory of the chemical that come in and the one that is released into the atmosphere or into the environment, we don't have to harass the, what, the, what, what, the, what the writer said, we don't have to harass the company. There where we can get a fair balance. I take you to the, to the, um, to the L, L, uh, not LPRC, but to the LEC issue. Those transformers got PCBs. They polychlorinated by phenyls. When these things are released into the environment, of course, they are persistent organic uh, pollutants. They stay there forever. Way, it's just difficult. But you... If the, if the community knows what they have around them, people can be aware. So hey. if you have a toxicity release inventory, you get the community involved, you let these people know, hey, this company is gonna operate here. This is what they're gonna have around you. We can keep eyes on them. We can, we can be the watchdog for them. And at the same time, they have their own inspector to monitor their own activity. We can balance so, it out. So but, I will come in to say uh, the EPA, uh, recently released uh, a chemical guidelines uh, uh, to regulate chemical handling, importation, and all that. 
Right. Uh, I, I think the EPA people can comment on that when it comes to the issue of uh, toxicity uh, inventory. Okay, so 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 let me just come in and let me just chip in a little bit. Yeah. You know, uh, um, yeah. the EPA is making strap as it comes to the regulation of or the management of chemicals in Liberia. Uh, proud to the coming in of the chemical regulation, we never had any other thing and you know, to lay our hands on to 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 properly manage the sector. But uh as we speak now, first of all, we have developed a list of banned chemicals into Liberia, or for sure. Uh, a list, a very, very comprehensive list uh, that contains most of these uh, pops and other chemicals that are banned in, uh, around the world. That's one. Additionally, we have developed a national chemical guideline. You know, the national chemical guideline is, is, is very, very young. Um, it gives us that that uh, leverage to like what he was saying to form the, the national chemical registry of Liberia because the, the chemical registry is not just a list of chemical but it it tells you the the name of the importer even the 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 the, the quantity that is being imported and so forth before the chemical registry will not have that leverage to do it but the chemical registry has also given that that you know that statutory mandate to do it so we have developed that registry and what is needed now is to continue to uh, update that identical registry additionally the epa has established or uh, the national chemical management committee and mr Tool is the head for that identical chemical uh, committee and he can comment on that uh we developed a national polluting registry the polluting registry is not just about chemical right it also have data containing waste it had the uh, uh, uh data containing effluent and so forth so we have we also work with with laboratories because chemical is not like any other ways that you can just wake up and say uh i'm going to dispose this identical chemical so at the epa we help you know work with laboratories to ensure that obsolete chemicals are properly disposed of because you don't just dispose it some of most of the chemicals needed to be one they need to be treated before they even being disposed into the environment. So we work with laboratory. We have also established that that communication network with other partners, and you know, established that uh, synergy with the the National Port Authority, the LRA, the NSC, and other stakeholders to ensure that you know any time chemical come into the country, the EPA is alerted. So we are making a great effort. We are making great effort, and we know that with time, we will get there. Gradually, we'll so, get it. So, on in on that note, is it? Uh, do you have? Does the EPA have an idea of all of the industries that operate that deal with chemicals? Do they know what chemicals these industries uh, work with? Exactly, exactly. So, I think Mara was saying something about the measure of toxicity. I uh, I don't know in which country where people have a device to measure toxicity. But what happened is that the word toxicity is associated with all chemicals, even the water. Okay. It depends on the amount that you take in. So toxicity depends on. So what we do at the EPA is what is to limit the exposure of this chemical to the inhabitant. Now, with the new the with the new the form uh, or company, yeah. when a company is coming to a laboratory, we ask them what what, what are the chemical you using. Let me give an example, even though the company is not in Moravia, in Arab Moravia, let me give an example of uh, MSG Gold. Okay. They are mining gold using cyanide. Right. And we are very, and they bring in copper, sulfur, all these things. And so what we do is that we have what we call parameter of concern. We make sure that this, this chemical that they, brought, that they brought in there, they are using, this chemical cannot enter into our natural water. They have a pool, so periodically we send we send our our uh, 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 ERS the laboratory people there bring sample of water and we monitor the amount of, uh, the the amount of chemical because they have limits. But you cannot if, if, if talking it, about talking about cyanide uh, or on, on, as as one of the chemicals that's on the list of the chemical guidelines is is sodium cyanide. Yeah, it's and, sodium cyanide. And, 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what is it being used for? Why is it on the list? It is. It is used by these uh, mining companies to extract gold. Because what they do is they are not mining free gold. They are mining uh, yeah. on oil in the racks. And so yeah. what happens is that they use it with the sun and they fluctuate, and then they, they purify that. But then what happens is that the wastewater contain this, and so we have to make sure that they they have they have to try by all means to detoxify the sun in the wastewater before it enter enter any body of water. And so we give them certain limits, the concentration of a free summer in the in the in the wastewater before a leaf the industrial go into the water. We so are let, me give, let, me, let me give an instance. Uh, uh, in my in, in my uh, the the district I come from, somewhere in Cape Town, the the heavy gold mining is going on there. Okay. And my village people drink from the the the, the running water from the creeks, and you know those things can those toxic chemicals can leach into water so what's 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 uh yeah. what's your I, take I, on that how i, how I are think people... you, you you have you are having reference to b martin okay. so, yeah so, yeah yeah b martin is one of the companies that is also <laughs> using sunlight and 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 you know there was a time but i think about five years ago we had to find them on the east same issue of the sunlight I because we get, a, we get a certain limitation we get a certain limitation and they, they went above the limit and so we have to find them. And so for now, with the creeks that's stemming from the MSG, we go, we go there periodically take water sample, even though they are they are analyzing the water too, but we also go there to verify it. So Mr. Toe, Mr. Toe, yeah. let, let's come back to the thing because but, for me, but, I, but, I, I, I tend to question let me why. Just, Saki, yeah, that, that, yeah. Mr. I just want to make sure. Uh-huh. I mean, I would love to be on the show for the next three hours. I just okay. want to make sure your your co-host Dennis Jai send you a message. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. All right. All right. I understand. Yeah. So, our uh, so just to uh, get your uh, your your take on this whole thing of finding people, finding companies, is that is that all to it? In the companies are fine. They pay big money and they continue. The same thing, or what happens? You no, know? Find it, uh, 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 we, we, we find people to detect from the action. It doesn't mean that they don't have to, because they, they have, we, 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 we get that certain regulation how to use the sunlight. So when they deviate, we find them. It's, it's for corrective measure. We do that for corrective so, measure. It doesn't mean that we have to stop them from using the sunlight. We have to make sure that they, they do it in a sustainable manner that it does not impact the environment and the people around it. All right. So, uh, gentlemen, let's, uh, sure. we sure. wish we have more time to discuss this. And uh, I'm sure we have another show coming up soon. And uh, just your parting comments so we can uh, wrap this up. Len. Okay. So, before I give my parting comment, yeah, before I give my parting, let me just give you a, a, a snapshot of. You know the, the way waste is managed in Liberia. So generally in Liberia, we have uh money super solid waste are handled according to levels, right? You have these CBOs, community organization that go from door to door and then collect waste, the waste and take it to holding and then the city ordinance take it from the holding centers and maybe carry it to uh the landfill or wherever they deem necessary. And but for industrial waste, especially the hazardous or the non-hazardous waste, they are being handled by by bigger entities that are certified by the EPA. On the issue of trade effluents, now, which arise from the operation of most of these industries, they are being handled by the industry themselves with mm -hmm. guardians from the EPA. That's why we gave we issue effluent discharge licenses. It's very, very important. Now, in this license. We outline uh, procedures, we outline conditions, we outline standards that needs to be uh, 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 met before those uh, effluent are discharged into the environment. So we set limits for, for example, you are talking about MNG go. We set limits for their effluent. So if you go above those limits, we also work. We don't just find you, but we also work with you to ensure that you know that the, those effluents are treated to meet standards before they are released into the environment. Great, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Your parting comment, Mr. Toe, briefly. 
what I, I, I really appreciate this program. Right. Right. But when it comes to yeah. environmental pollution in Moravia, we should not limit it to just a chemical alone. You can remember just around uh, the Enfi area that we have Fiamma, there was an area there where sewage were done, were done, done. But then they have vegetation that are purify the wastewater before they go into the same, uh, 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 the Mesorado River. But you know, the residents have a means of while using fuel oil into their 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 their, their, their septic tank. You know, and so when they when the truck take the, the sewage. The oil will separate, the, the waste oil will separate and kill all the vegetation. So as we as we still, as present, the sewage water just come from our fear all the way and roll into our mesorado. That's contaminant, that's heavy metal, everything, and then mesorado, the fish also ingest all of them. And there's a drainage that passes through Moravia. That drainage is nothing but feces. And enter into the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, just behind the mansion. Now, yeah. if this was if this was done by a complaint, we could regulate it. But this is done by the public. EPA had no way to control it. Wow. So these things, I, I hope we, I hope we have to this. You know, yeah, bring it out to the wait, public so wait. that one day we we'll address it. And maybe we we'll gotta help. You know, to 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 remedy this 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 contamination because they also affecting us. Yes, we'll have more time to discuss these things where we we not we don't have time in our favor. Mr. Morris, your parting comment. Yes. I mean well, best management practice is one way for best management practice in the context of yeah. each one teaching one on how to dispose of any kind of waste in the environment. Len, it's your responsibility. Mr. Toe, it's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Saga is your responsibility. Coupled with that, in an industrial context as well, transparency matters. The government needs to be transparent matters. with residents in the community. We can start from there. If an industrial comes here to operate in this particular community, let the, before the government grants them the permit, the government needs to get the, the community involved as to the kind of chemical that's going to be coming within the environment. From there, we can start because the environment is for all of us and it's of all of us responsibility to make sure we keep it as pristine as possible. The introduction of an industry in the environment offset the balance between the, the, the fauna and the flora. And we can balance it. We can rebalance it. Or if we just get involved with transparency, that's it. Thank you. Great, great. Key takeaway here, transparency, the issue of education, each one teach one. And the issue of public involvement into environmental issues, though, safeguard the environment and human well-being. I want to thank all of you for coming in. And this has been an interesting conversation. I look forward to more of these. And we don't have time in our favor. But I want to thank everyone. And I want to thank the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia for the strong support in allowing your representatives to be here today to discuss such an important thing. We need to go more beyond our talking and take it to our communities and make sure that uh, public health and well-being is something we take high. So I want to thank my uh, people at controls, uh, Mr. Janice Ja and Mr. Anthony, C uh, so, uh, Anthony for uh, allowing this program to be on focus on Liberia. Again, I hope to meet you again in two weeks. That is another top, uh, important topic we're going to have in the next two weeks on chemistry and society. From me here in Atlanta, Georgia, I want to thank all the viewers, listeners, and those who made your comments. We couldn't read all of the comments. We thank you all for your contribution. And I would like to say good evening, good morning, and wherever you are, I look forward to meeting you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.